How's this for an eclectic background, performer, teacher, storyteller, entrepreneur, and expert? Well, somebody has that and more. It's my guest, Michelle Danner. She's the legendary acting teacher and founder of the Creative Center for the Arts and the Los Angeles Acting Conservatory. She's also a successful film director. Her current film, Miranda's Victim, will screen June 24th at the 9th Annual Nevada Women's Film Festival at the UNLV Department of Film in Las Vegas. The festival runs June 22nd through the 25th. For ticket information, go to nwffest.com. That's nwffest.com. And for everything about Michelle Danner, go to michelledanner.com and you can follow her on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And Michelle, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. What are, I'm going to ask you these two questions because some of our listeners and viewers may not know, what are the Creative Center for the Arts about and the Los Angeles Acting Conservatory about? Well, the Los Angeles Acting Conservatory is a conservatory, acting classes for actors of all levels. Uh, it's also tied into the Michelle Danner Acting School. We have a lovely location close to Sony Studios on Culver City. And I always like to say I wanted to put these murals on the wall. So if you drive from the ocean to Hollywood, it's lit up. This beautiful red mural says you can't spell heart without art. And if you drive in the opposite direction, uh, you'll have another one that says you can't make art without heart. And that completely embodies our philosophy at the school. Um, and the Creative Theater Group is uh, the group that puts on, you know, uh, events and shows. Uh, we were obviously halted a little bit by COVID, but we're back. As a matter of fact, during the whole time I was rehearsing with Ann Archer, the incredible Ann Archer, a one-woman show based on Norris Church, Norris Church Mailer's life, the wife of Norman Mailer, a memoir. And it's a wonderful show, and we shot it in virtual theater during COVID, and it's actually going to come out June 1. Uh, so, you know, that's the creative theater group, and we're in development for other plays, and uh, we're very excited about, you know, what the future holds, especially now. I noticed a slight accent, unless it's just me. Is it? Is it do you have an accent? Are you? I, I speak fluently five languages. I speak French, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, and obviously English. Yes, obviously, better than me. So that's that's fun. I like your concept of the heart with art. It's so antithetical to what we think of in Hollywood as. Uh, in order to make art, you have to be shallow, you know, but that's just uh, some people's take on Hollywood, let us say. So I, I like the idea of the heart behind your art. Your your current film is called Miranda's Victim. And as I mentioned earlier, it's going to be at the ninth annual Nevada Women's Festival uh, coming up. at the Yeah, we're so excited. How did you get started in that? How did you decide to, to pick that subject of Miranda? And, and again, for our audience, it has to do with it's called Miranda's Victim, which is a great title because it has to do with the law, but also a human being. So I'll let you explain. So this project, this movie was offered to me, but the moment that I started to read about it, I obviously understood right away it was an important story that had never been told, which was so strange in itself. But uh, the woman that it happened to, Patricia Weir, six over 60 years ago now, chose to not talk about it, kept it mostly a secret, even from her family. And so when George Culver, our um, main writer producer, saw an interview about it, he posed the question, what happened to this? What happened to the, What happened to this lady? And of course, all the movies that um you know, we always see you have the right to remain silent, you have the right to this, you have the right to that. And I've never questioned where did that come from? Even my last movie, The Runner, first seen in, you have the right to remain silent. And so to have never questioned it all these years, to have never known what the story is, which is an incredible story about justice, personal justice, justice in a court of law. And um, it's a great twist at the end, which is also what drew me to tell the story. You know, it's it's karmic justice at the end. I thought, what a story that had never been told. You mentioned that she never talked about it, including to her family. Uh, is she still alive? Yes. 
very much so. She actually has a cameo in the movie. I, I was going to ask you whether you were able to get in touch with her and, and see. Yeah, no, she has. She's in the wedding scene. As a matter of fact, there's a moment where uh, Josh Bowman, who plays the husband Charles, turns and kisses her on the cheek. So she's in the wedding in the wedding scene. She has seen the movie. She, you know, was very emotional about it. She loved it. Very supportive. Yeah. How were you able to ask her to be involved in the project? How were you able to convince her? I should say. Well, who had involved. the relationship with her was George Colber. He had the relationship with her and he asked her and I met her and thanked her for her courage then and her courage now, you know, that she's allowed the story to be told. Do you think that people, again, I'll go back to the fact that people are familiar with Miranda and you have the right to remain silent and looking at the other side of it where you have a human victim. Do you think that your film will give a little bit more of a perspective to rights versus humans or rights versus justice? Well, you know, the film doesn't take any sides in terms of that. We really just, because the story had never been told, we just set out to tell the story. Mm -hmm. um, people will make of it what they want. They'll think this is right or this is not right. You know, let, let everybody will form their own opinion. But I just told, I, I chose to tell the story. How did you set up the film when you decided to tell this story? Did it involve a combination of meeting with Miranda, but also well, meeting with the victim and also getting it fleshed out so you get the sense of what the impact was on her? And then did you then go and you obviously cast it a certain way? So I was just curious about the process involved and how you worked the, worked the film out. Well, you know, she spans, she starts when she's 18, the the, the main character, uh, Patricia Weir, Trish. And, um, and she, you know, we span until 1970, we go to 1975. So I had a lot of young actresses on my desk, 18 year old actresses. And then on the right side of my desk, I remember distinctly this moment, because I had the picture of Abigail Breslin, who, of course, we all love and watched her grow up. Um, and I, there's, there was a voice inside of me that said, you know, stop. I'm sure I can't curse on your show. No, stop go ahead. Talking, it's fine. That's fine. Stop fucking around and just get a real actress. And we offered it to her. She read it immediately. We met the day after and had coffee and looked into each other's eyes and said, we're going to make this movie. So when I always go back on events in my life, I know that there are meant to be's and Abigail Abby playing this part was certainly a meant to be. She carries the movie in an incredible way. I'll never forget, you know, when Donald Sutherland said to her, you know, you're you're a wonderful actress. Um, nice. She's a wonderful actress. She's, you know, incredibly professional, but she brings her heart to it. And she's got a, a very unique generosity of spirit. She gives whether she's on camera or whether she's acting for someone else's coverage. Mm -hmm. When you, because you mentioned earlier, you're not taking a necessarily a, a side or stand with the film, but as people see the film, do you get a different reaction from females that see it versus males that see it? And do you, get, do you think males that see it get a better insight in terms of what the story is that they may not have before? But I can tell you that we have had three screenings on the festival circuit. The first one was the opening night movie at the Santa Barbara Film Festival. The second one was Gasparilla, the Tampa F Festa Theater in uh, Tampa Bay, Florida. Both historical theaters, by the way. And the third one was in Houston. The first two um, were very well uh, attended. This, the third one was a smaller screening. But the first one was 2,000 people. The second one was 1,000 people. And the third one, in every single screening, People have come and have wanted to give me a hug and had tears in their eyes, women, because they were very impacted by the story. Um, and they were grateful the way that it was handled. Everybody mentioned that, uh, that it was, you know, there's a rape in it and it was handled in a very uh, sensitive way. Um, but ultimately, I wanted to make a movie that would inspire people to speak their truth, 
uh, people that would, you know, not, they would be brave enough to come forth and tell their story. And it is not an easy thing to have happen, no. you know, and no. a lot of times it's, you know, the, 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 the tables are turned on women that come forth and talk about assault. Sometimes you know, they're held responsible. And so therefore there's a, a very um, scary statistic at the end of the movie, but very true that only five out of a thousand come forth and, and do it and tell the story because of the possible repercussions, because of the shame, because of the fear and, uh, you know, myriad of other reasons that hold people back. So I'm hoping that this will inspire people to, you know, seek justice. It's possible you can have it. Patricia Weir, you know, went for it and fought for it several times. She sadly had to relive the nightmare, but, um, but she was courageous enough to do it. Did she come to any of the festival screenings? No, no, but she came to screenings, but not to the festival because, you know, one was in Santa Barbara. Right. Was, yeah. I just thought maybe she would be, would help her in a sense, seeing how people react to the film in, in that kind of yeah. setting versus the when primary we, screening. Yeah, when we will show the movie on the East Coast, she will. Oh, good. Okay. You, we you haven't mentioned... come out yet. It's going to come out in the fall. Okay. And you mentioned, too, that um, a lot of people are afraid to come forward, even after the beginnings of the, and I phrase it that way, after the beginnings of the Me Too, Too movement, there's still women who have been assaulted, and probably men as well, who are afraid to come forward because of getting shamed or other consequences that are there. So it's always a, I don't know, you can't really, you can't do a percentage thing to see once the film is seen by more people, how many more people will come forward. But certainly some will, having seen it or recommended by a relative who watched the film as well. So your film, I guess, in a way is entertainment, but at the same time can provide some solace to people who have gone through something like that and perhaps motivate them to come forward and and let people know what happened. I hope so. I really, truly do. How long did the filming take when you once you got going? Uh, we shot for 28 days of principal photography, uh, five-day weeks. We were in New Jersey. Then we went to Arizona. Um, the last couple of days, there were thunderstorms in New Jersey. And so we had to halt production. So I lost time. And, you know, so I, I walk in the last day of shooting and I have an absolutely unrealistic <laughs> number of shots that I have to get. Right. I have 27 setups and everybody looked at me as if I was completely crazy. But I had a plan. I had a plan and I uh, I made it happen by some miracle. I was shell-shocked at the end. You know? <laughs> when we called, it was a wrap. I don't know how I did it, but it was one of the, the biggest challenges. And uh, I was able to get everything that I needed no reshoots, no pickups. So it was great. You strike me as a very organized person, especially with your your other things that you've got going on as well. So somehow you're able to do all of that. I try to be. I strive to be. I, I don't know. I try. I've always admired people that are not only organized in life, but also organized in their minds. I guess it goes hand in hand. Maybe it's not organization so much as you have the drive. And I, I get, that was going to originally be my first question to you, but I wanted you to talk about your other two involvements. Where does the drive come from? What What is your background that gave you this drive to do what you do? I don't know. I mean, I think partly you're born with it. You have that chip, right? And then it's like nature versus environment. And the other one is, you know, how you grew up. I mean, I... It was the daughter of a, of a singer and uh, and of a very famous producer who opened the William Morris Agency in Paris in the 60s. So I was, you know, exposed to a lot of arts and I traveled a lot and we had the highs and the lows of my childhood. You know, we lived in a castle with, um, you know, a lot of help. We flew first class and, you know, we had, we, there was, and then you know, there were times where uh, my dad experienced some lows and, you know, they turned off the lights because the electric bill wasn't paid or a check was bounced to the market. So I, I didn't, you know, I wasn't born with a silver spoon. Right. I experienced, um, and, and so maybe that is conducive to giving you drive. 
You know, I mean, I saw my dad pull up. My dad flew in from Tokyo to take me to school for the first day in a limo. And uh, because that's how much he loved his children and he wanted to be there for them. And um, so those were the highs, you know, and uh, and like I said, the lows is, you know, we all had to chip in and go work and wait on tables so we could, you know, pay bills when when things were not so great. Um, you know, and I always worry about that with my kids, even though I don't say say that they're children of privilege. You know, I don't feel that they are. But they certainly haven't um, gone through what we went through in our childhood. We're four girls, which was, but it was great. It was like an awakening. It was like, you know, this is what the real world is like. And so you have to fight in this world. You have to work hard in this word, in this world to make, you know, a mark. And it sounds with that background that you were very much grounded, as you say, in reality, in the real world. And that I think helps you in the long run in terms of getting over some of the, the downs as well as enjoying the ups. Yes. Lows and highs in that sense. Yeah. Now, it's, it's an interesting background. And you're right. When you have kids and you're doing well, they don't necessarily remember. You don't have to sit them down and say, well, you know, I had to walk to school in the snow for you know, two hours to get to school. It's a lot of grandparents, parents tell their kids just to kind of give them a sense of what the sacrifices were. I'm exaggerating, obviously, in your right. case, but still, it's the same principle, which is how do you communicate to your kids that you do have to strive, you do have to work hard, even if you come from a comfortable background. We won't say privileged, but a comfortable. I, I saw your name and I my immediately my thought went to that you're somehow related to Blythe Danner. Would I be totally incorrect? Yeah, no, no. But I okay. did have a conversation with her about it a very long time ago, but we're not related. Okay. When you started your career again as a female, did you find it initially hard just because of that and getting involved with the Creative Center for the Arts and the Los Angeles Acting Conservatory? Was there some prejudice initially or were, did you find yourself on an equal footing with everybody else as you progressed up the ladder in Hollywood? You know, I mean, listen, I'm sure that there have been some uh, barrier, some limitations. I never was aware of it. It's never something I've focused on. It's never something I've even thought of. Until recently, I would been offered to direct a, a big movie. It's a science fiction space movie. And I started to research it and realized that those movies were only directed by men. Only one woman, woman uh, did it. I mean, I'm sure maybe there's more, but the one that comes to mind was Mimi Leader and Deep Impact years and years ago. Um, so it's interesting, though they don't really ask women to direct those movies. I'm sure that that will change. So that got me thinking about that. But normally my, um, you know, I don't think so much about it. I, I don't, you know, I, I'm probably just a feminist. I do what I want to do. And I don't wait for anybody to tell me if I can do it or not. Right. Um, You're not a professional victim. You just do what you need to do. Yeah, but I don't focus on it. I don't think about it too much. I just do it. But I certainly feel strongly that there need to be more opportunities for women directors, for sure, and women in general. If you look at the history of Hollywood, I was just thinking just in the 40s, Aya Lapina was one of the few female directors at the time. Mm, the 50s, yeah. I probably should say, rather than the 40s. And she was married to Howard Duff. So there was there was some connection in terms of just I don't want to say nepotism, but at least she had an end because she was in the business with Howard. So there's right, that. Right, right, yeah. right, right. Exactly. Is there an informal group of females that are working together to kind of advance the idea that there should be more female directors? Uh, yeah, there is. Gina Davis has a group, I think, that analyzes, you know, how many women get these opportunities and She's a wonderful actress and, and, you know, an activist in terms of that. No, I mean, very clearly, we were not ready for a woman president. Maybe, hopefully, we will be now. Um, there needs to be more women that, you know, there's no question about it, get all these opportunities. When you get approached to direct a movie, how how do you look at that? You, you mentioned about the science fiction film, and you research it, and that's when you discovered that all the directors were male, except for one at the time. I'm sure that you look at it from a couple other angles. So what's your, I hate to use this term, but I'll use it because I can't think of another word. What's your process for deciding whether you want to direct a film or not? If the story, uh, you know, uh, 
if the story really hits me, if there's a, a, a human side to it, in this particular movie, Helios, that was offered to me, um, had a, a strong, you know, um, pull in terms of, you know, what do people do um, when there's a huge crisis? You know, what kind of humanity it brings out in people? And that's a theme that that's really drew me. Other themes that have drawn me in the past have been, um, you know, when our children fall through the cracks. I really feel like it's all of our children. It's all our sons. You know, that theme also has driven me to directing movies. You know, I think you just have to connect to what it's about, ultimately. The reason I made that reference earlier as a joke about Hollywood being shallow is your approach is art with a heart. And obviously the projects you take have to tell a story and have some meaning to it. And that's why I think you're different than a lot of other people in Hollywood. Not all people, but clearly there's a commercial side to these things that art is obviously commerce as well. So there's always that balancing act between deciding on a film that's going to make a lot of money or deciding on a film that's going to communicate something with heart or deciding on a film that can do both. Do you look at both sides of that when you take on a project? I think a movie has to be entertaining if you're asking me to sit for 90 minutes or two hours or a little more. Um, you know, I, I have to be entertained on a certain level. Um, I also like to be moved. I mean, I can appreciate all kinds of visual effects, but ultimately, if it doesn't, you know, penetrate me, if it doesn't mm -hmm. move me, I, I don't feel like I'm spending my time well. Um, but I think it has to entertain you and it has to, you know, I always like things that are about something as opposed to you know, just purely entertaining. Uh, but, you know, having two kids, I can tell you that I have sat through my share of everything. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> my two kids have all kinds of distinct tastes. I sat through the seven seasons of the hundred. I I'm not saying anything bad about it, actually. I understand. Students that get cast in that. Um, but, um, you know, and then we were doing Better Call Saul. I mean, there's, there's a list. Right. <laughs> um, and everybody has a different dance card, so I'm very, uh, uh, I'm very busy here. It's like, no, you're watching with me. No, you're watching with me, and my sister's here, and no, you're watching with me. And but I get to watch a lot of different things, which is great because I, anyway, I have an eclectic taste. People always ask me. I like to watch all kinds of different genres. Are you able to convince or convert your children to a couple of films that you like that they may not have thought about, and not necessarily current films, but past films? Let me tell you, my children are so supportive and they um they want to do whatever it is to help me so when we did miranda's victim we watched every legal courtroom drama thriller suspense movie that you can imagine and now for this i'm watching every science fiction space disaster movie that you can imagine so you know i usually do and now uh, and my son is on a um a western festival he goes on different festivals he studies film and theater at usc so uh, we just watched Stagecoach with John Wayne, which left my own devices. I can't tell you that I would watch that or rewatch it because I think I watched it such a long time ago. But it's great because I'm 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 forced to rewatch things that I would say I've seen it already. Mm -hmm. And every time you rewatch something, it it makes you go deeper inside of it. So I'm always grateful for that. I've, I've I'm always grateful with all the ideas that they have and I just go along with their ideas. So we do one each. Nice. That works. Your other film is called, or your last film is called The Runner. So tell us a little bit about The Runner as well. Yeah. So that was uh, something that uh, came to me when I was watching a news report about these kids that were, you know, forced by law enforcement to go undercover and catch the big drug kinpin of the town. And I was like, oh my God, I mean, they're, they're in so much danger and where are the grownups and who's taking care of these kids? And I, you know, I started to cry because one of the stories ended badly. And I wrote um, a three-page treatment that I sent to a friend of mine, Jason Chase Terrell, wonderful writer who wrote the screenplay. And um, yeah, and we I, I was seeing, I was teaching an acting class because you know, I'm an acting teacher as well. And this young actor did a scene in class. All the lights went out on Main Street. So everybody, held, I said there were three scenes. Everybody held up their phone. So it was kind of, you know, that atmosphere so we right. could finish the work that night. And he did the scene and, and I really had chills. I was like, this is an incredible talent. Um, and so 
I asked him to look at the script that I was developing with, with this wonderful writer and he really liked it. And we were going to shoot it in April. Uh, thank God we didn't. We ended up shooting it in December because we would have never shot it in April because of COVID. We would have not done it. So we got right in the elevator as the door closed. We finished shooting right before the lockdown. Um, and I edited leisurely while we were home on lockdown which was great. And then we entered a lot of film festival and won a lot of awards. And that's actually what got me the Miranda movie. Um, so, um, cause I was on some list. So it's, it's, uh, you know, one thing is a stepping stone to another. I love that movie. Cameron Douglas also is in it. Elizabeth Rome is in it. Eric Balfour and a slew of young, talented actors. And uh, the movie was acquired by Saban Films. It's playing, you know, you can get it anywhere online. Uh, it had a theatrical and uh, some wonderful reviews. So I'm excited about it. You sound like a, you lead a very complete life in the sense that you have family, you have films that mean something to you, you teach. So you're dealing with up and coming young talent as well. Sounds like a pretty good life. I can't say that I don't have a good life. I have a good life. <laughs> I, really, I really, really do. I'm about to uh, go to Europe now. We have an incredible trip. I'm taking my kids to Rome and Venice. And we uh, got into the Ischia Film Festival, which is a great film festival close to Naples and Sardinia, which we'll be going there and then to France. Uh, I'm shooting uh, a little movie in August. I mean, uh, yeah, I don't think I can complain. There's a lot of great <laughs> things going on. Before I let you go, any future plans beyond Miranda's Victim, which again, we'll talk about where it's at. It's at the ninth Annual Nevada Women's Film Festival. And I'll mention all that information in a moment, but any upcoming plans beyond? Uh, well, Miranda's I am Victim? in, um, you know, the, the Miranda's movie will be playing in uh, several film festivals, Cinequest, Catalina, two historical theaters. Very excited. It'll make four historical theaters in the U.S. Nice. Uh, we, um, uh, I'm going to uh, direct uh, a movie called The Italians. Hopefully there will not be, knock wood, a strike. But if there is, there is. What are you going to do? Uh, people have to fight for what's right. And... Um, and yeah, Miranda's Victim is going to come out in the fall. Yeah. Well, that's great. Great way to leave it. My guest has been Michelle Danner. She's a legendary acting teacher and founder of the Creative Center for the Arts and the Los Angeles Acting Conservatory. Her current film, Miranda's Victim, will screen June 24th at the 9th Annual Nevada Women's Film Festival at the UNLV Department of Film in Las Vegas. The festival runs June 22nd through the 25th. And for ticket information, go to nwffest.com. That's nwffest.com. And for everything about Michelle Danner, go to michelledanner.com. And you can follow her on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Michelle, thanks for being on the show. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Bye. See you next time.